Welcome. I want I want to welcome you today to this session, and I will be introducing Fred Schellenberg with uh, or from American Organization for Immigrants. Fred will be talking to us about the needs of the immigration population. So thank you, Fred, for being with us, and welcome again, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the summit, and I hope you enjoy the session, Fred. Okay. Good morning. Um, I, I, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I'm, I'd like to talk about three things this morning. First of all, a little bit of a commercial for my organization, American Organization for Immigrants. Then I'd, talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the process that uh, we share and partner with on the Interfaith Welcoming Coalition to help the migrants coming up from Central America to, to the United States. And then finally, and, and while I'm talking about that, I would also like to describe some of the needs of the uh, migrants as they pass through San Antonio. And then finally, I'd like to talk on, uh, briefly on some of the issues that are confronting the folks that are uh, on the border waiting to seek asylum to come into the United States, particularly in the, in the, with the backdrop of this uh, coronavirus. Okay, um, first of all, um, our goal is really uh, based on the, uh, the same issues that our immigration laws are based on. And that is a basis of pre preserving family unity. And uh, that's assisting with family-based petitions. What does that mean? It means that if somebody has come to San Antonio from Mexico, for example, and they're a lawful permanent resident, but their family's still down in Guadalajara, we help that person uh, go through all the paperwork and the necessary protocols and procedures to uh, have that family prepared to immigrate to the United States. And of course, the ultimate path is the, or the next step is to seek citizenship. And we help those folks in the application process. But uh, one of the things that we also do is that we help them with English as a second language and the civic and history courses, because as you know, when you take the citizenship exam, you have to answer out of about 120 different questions, things about the history of the United States and how our government is organized. And finally, we offer low cost immigration services. And those services were accredited, that we provide and were accredited by the Department of Justice to perform this, these services. And these are services related to legal immigration services related to asylum, renewal of DACA, employment offer, authorization, and so forth. In a broader sense, you can think of us is that we offer help and information about the immigration process and path to lawful permanent residence and citizenship. Furthermore, we, we provide to low, our low-income in, uh, clients orientation on how to adapt to the cultural changes and responsibilities to live in our country, the importance of learning English, and how to prepare for things like finding meaningful employment. Part of this is a basis that we started the uh, NGO about three years ago. And that had to do with, uh, we were volunteers at different uh, other organizations in the city. And uh, we had um, learned that there was not one place where a person who wanted some help could go to get everything done at the same time. And so we started this NGO in 2017. And what we really are like coaches, and so we answer questions about employment, about what it means to get your child in school, as well as doing the, the legal paperwork to uh, become a lawful permanent citizen. You know, and our vision really is to ensure that our clients' integration is, is, is as legal permanent residents and citizens here in the United States. We're uh, open uh, Monday uh, through Thursday and most evenings and Saturdays with appointments. We're easy to find. We're right across the street from Thomas Jefferson High School on Donaldson. And those are our phone numbers, 210-250-0762 or 210-454-2164. And we're fluent in Spanish, uh, so don't worry about that. Okay. And our goals for this year, that started at the beginning, and really are focused on family uh, unity. And so uh, our plan is to have four citizenship workshops for local permanent residents. 
And what does that mean? That means about a two and a half to three hour session where we explain uh, the documents that are needed, what the requirements are to become a lawful to for a lawful permanent resident to become a U.S. citizen and uh, how to fill out the forms and pay the fees and, and so forth. The other uh, goal for this year is four tutorial classes for the citizenship interviews. We um, go through a series of sessions. I've got a series of uh, online learning programs that help people learn uh, the answers and, and study what it means to be a U.S. citizen. And these are done in English. As for some uh, clients who don't speak uh, English very well, we have the courses in Spanish as well. And depending on their age and the amount of time that they've been in the United States, they may be able to take the examination um, and the interview in Spanish. We also seek to expand uh, the expansion of our capability to assist asylum cases. Part of our efforts with the Interfaith Welcoming Coalition is to help those arriving from Central America. And oftentimes those um, folks, they are asking for asylum. And many times without having a representative or an attorney working for them, they don't realize the implication of meeting the deadlines, staying in touch with the immigration service, uh, showing up for the immigration court appearances or, or appearing at the uh, scheduled hearings with the uh, immigration Customs Enforcement Service. When they miss these deadlines and don't show up, then they're very liable to uh, face deportation, even in absentia. One of the things that I'd like to just point out, and I'm sure you all recognize the importance of this, is the number of uh, immigrants that we have here in San Antonio. Our San Antonio population is about two and a half million, more or less. And about 15, I would say about 15% are uh, immigrants in, in uh, San Antonio. So it's a sizable, a sizable portion. And um, the foreign born households spend about this, given the ratio in the population, they spend about 15% of the, of the 30 to $35 billion in uh, uh, gross sales in the San Antonio area each year. Um, and that's about $5 billion. So the immigrant population is an important element in making San Antonio work. Our focus are the clients that, uh, or as clients, are those folks who are here in San Antonio as lawful permanent residents and uh, can have the possibility of becoming citizens. We're constantly reaching out through our connections here in, in San Antonio, through the City of San Antonio Immigration Liaison Service, through different churches, through the Interfaith Welcoming Coalition, and our partnerships with other NGOs here in San Antonio to uh, help folks that are looking uh, for a low cost. And, uh, and we do pro, a lot of pro bono work as well. We're all volunteers in this organization. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the migration issues that we have for those folks that are uh, the women mostly that are coming to San Antonio from Central America. One of the uh, issues that uh, you've all read about in the paper and, and are acutely aware of is the, the violence against women in Central America. And this slide is just to highlight some of the points that uh, 50 percent of the murders of women in Guatemala are, are gang related, bandilleros. 90 percent of the murders are not prosecuted in Guatemala. And of the top five countries for, for female murders, three of them are in Central America, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Well, these women have a lot of reasons to be fleeing from those countries and coming up to the United States. Unfortunately, the atmosphere that we have here in the United States is making it more and more difficult for them and their children and, and husbands uh, to get asylum. And that's why it's important that uh, we feel that it's important that we expand our capability to help those folks arriving to the United States and, and seeking asylum. Steps in the journey. Says, um, I, know I, I lived for about 20 years in, in Mexico and uh, worked in Mexico and Central America. And it's not an easy trip. Um, travel north through Mexico, generally they 
have been surrendering at the border. Most of the folks that are coming up don't have uh, visas to travel to the United States. So they're either coming across the border at the checkpoints, and that's where some of the administration's policies about remaining in Mexico and the Mexico uh, protocols mean that people have to wait in, in Mexico in shelters and halfway houses until their number comes up for an interview. If they do go across the border illegally, entering without inspection and are picked up by a border patrol agent, they're placed in detention. And that's even changing now. And I'll talk about, I'll talk more about that later. But uh, if they convince the border patrol agent in that first instance that they are uh, seeking asylum and they have a credible fear, they're then detained in something called the ice box, the Ibera. And I've been in some of these offices of the border patrol on the border and they're cold. I don't know if it's because the agents spend so much time out in the hot sun and when they come in the office, they want to feel the flesh, but it's, it's cold in those. And so the folks that are coming up when they're held in detention, um, they have these names for it, that and the dog pound. And while they're processing, if they pass that initial step, then they will be held in, in detention. Here's a snapshot of the routes that uh, folks are using. Most of the folks that are coming up from Central America are, are crossing over through Guatemala at Tapachua. Um, uh, some are coming over at uh, Tinosique, over on the uh, uh, eastern side of Mexico, but it seems to me that most of them are passing through uh, Tapachula. And it's, a, a, you know, everybody has their own way of coming up. A lot of them are using coyotes, and the amount of money that they're paying for a coyote depends between five to $10,000. They also are using a common day, um, very ways to, to get to the United States, either by using the La Bestia or uh, using a bus or using uh, friends to give them rides as they hopscot uh, across Mexico to the U.S. border. At one time, we had more folks coming across and going up through uh, uh, Tijuana, entering Tijuana through the California point. But now the statistics indicate that. Most of the folks that are coming up from Central America are passing from into Texas, from Ciudad Juarez, all the way down to Matamoros. I've seen this train, and this is this is a real photo. Uh, it's incredible, and I'm sure many of you have seen the movies that that talk about the travels and the and the violence. Uh, folks that are coming on this thing are subject to extortion uh, the women are, are particularly vulnerable uh, and uh, it, it's just very hard I, I i can't believe how they must be suffering so much in honduras or guatemala or el salvador to to flee and take the risk to come up in these uh, in these areas this is a snapshot of a holding facility uh, <clears throat> In uh, this is a facility of the Mexican immigration uh, in Tapachula, where they separate the men, uh, the men and women and children are separated from the men, and they're terribly overcrowded. And again, uh, given the backdrop of the coronavirus, you can see how if someone is detained, it'd be very diff difficult to maintain the social distances. And once the virus is uh, start spreading there, it's just going to spread like a, a wildfire. I, I just don't know how we're going to be able to help folks in that condition. Here's uh, one of the uh, Border Patrol facilities in, uh, in uh, Brownsville. And uh, you can see uh, how they have folks on the pallets. They're stay stacked in there very close together. They're on these mats and the uh, aluminum foil is it's not very thick, it tears easily. And uh, the food that uh, they're given is not a taco, not a tortilla, but generally it's a, a ham and cheese sandwich in a, in a, a bun. And then if you're not used to having those things and, and that's all you get. It's not very, very appetizing, but it is something. After the uh, process, uh, uh, extends and assuming that the person has made that initial threshold for credible fear, 
They're moved to, in Texas, they're moved to family uh, detention facilities, um, depending on their background and, and uh, uh, who they are and if they've got a criminal activity to either Dilly or uh, Carnes, Texas. I've actually gone down to Carnes and uh, helped the women there prepare for their second level of uh, credible fear uh, interviews when they meet with an asylum office. Many times that uh, particular interview is done over TV and the judges here in San Antonio. We also have, um, well, the majority of the folks uh, speak Spanish, but there's a significant number that do not, Spanish is not their initial, uh, their uh, main language. And we wind up using an interpreter by the telephone. So it's all very complicated for someone that is uh, being thrust into this and without representation, and the fact that they're being confronted by using a telephone to do the interpretation, and then it has to be translated into English, it makes it very confusing for a person who's trying to give their declaration about why they're, why they fear for themselves, to, why they left their country, and why they fear to return. And those are two separate questions. And uh, the asylum officers go over these various various times. Many times when I'm speaking to women, I ask them, tell me what happened when you had your first child. And they can tell me uh, the time of day, where they were, who was with them, what the clothes were, how the room smelled, what happened, and so forth. And I use that as an example uh, to say these are the kinds of details that you have to include in your declaration of why you left El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and why you're afraid to return. Clearly, uh, one of the aspects of it is uh, the trauma that these women and men have experienced as they fled from their home countries. And sometimes that clouds their memory and they can't remember all the details. And so that's why having a representative uh, help them through the process is so, so important. It helps them clarify, it helps them focus, helps them remember some of the details. And by going through these uh, interviews several times, person has a much better chance of uh, gaining asylum here in the United States. The other points is that uh, these uh, administration, these facilities have been expanded, um, as you've seen on the television and the news reporting. Not only do we have the, the fixed facilities in Carnes, Dilly, and, and in Burks, Pennsylvania, which is a much smaller one, Carnes is, has about uh, the capability for about 1,500 people. Dilly is, I think, about 2,500 people. They're not full right now, given the shutdown on the border, but that's the capacity. And uh, the Trump administration is budgeted for expansion of 10 facilities. These facilities are operated by private companies, and they're, they're for profit. And the, the, the statistical numbers that are the financial numbers that come out of these companies show that it's really expensive on the way that we're handling and detaining our fo uh, people coming to the United States seeking asylum. I guess the bottom line is, is that we don't need to be protected from asylum seeking family. We need to be protecting them. It is a prison-like facility, and there's inadequate medical care. We've had instances, and, and you as uh, community health workers will know that it's really important to make sure you give the right dosage for the, vac for the, for the medicine for flus or colds and stuff like that. And oftentimes the dosages were larger than what was needed and there was a, a reaction to that. They uh, are awaiting the credible fair interviews while they're in de uh, detention. But if there's folks like me are not going down to help them in the representation, they will have to do that on their own. And if they fail that credible fear, then they will probably be deported. And they can be held in detention while that process is underway for several weeks. We've had fo uh, people, women stay in Corinth for as much as uh, six to eight weeks. Hard to read this slide, but uh, the point I wanted to make here is that there's several ways that somebody can come to the United States seeking asylum. One, there's a refugee process, which means a person is asking to come to the United States from outside of the United States. These would be the refugees uh, seeking to come to the United States from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Syria. And they go through a vetting process through the United Nations. And then the United States 
uh, once the United States accepts them. Under the Trump administration, uh, that number has been cut back to 18,000 a year. We used to be allowing them between 85 to 100,000 applicants every year. So it's a real uh, a closing of our welcoming arms to folks that uh, want to seek as uh, uh, asylum as a refugee in the United States. The other way that folks, uh, people can come into the United States is that they have a passport uh, and they have a visa to travel into the United States. They enter into the United States, enter with inspection, and once here, they decide that they uh, don't want to go back to their home country for a variety of reasons. Once they do that, they can then ask for asylum. The third way is when somebody doesn't have the travel documents, and this is what happens to a lot of the people coming up from Central America. They come up to Mexico, they go to the border, and then they cross the border and in, at a port of entry, and they tell the Border Patrol that they want to uh, they're asking for asylum. Our, our process, when there were, the numbers weren't so great, was rather straightforward. There would be an interview, and if the uh, Border Patrol person thought that the story was reasonable and there was uh, sufficient reason to, to allow that person to come in, the person would be admitted and then go through this process that I've already uh, described about being in detention while there was a um, credible fear interview by an asylum officer. If uh, they don't want to wait and they decide to just come in, they'll cross the border without inspection. And that's what's happened. And that's part of the reason that the administration has had such severe reactions to people coming across the border. Those uh, uh, entering in that, in that way they can still ask for asylum, but the process is a little more difficult now. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, the American Organization for Immigrants, we're partners with the San, San Antonio Interfaith Welcoming Coalition. And you may know this, that the coalition came together in 2014 in response to the, huge, the surge of, of uh, people coming up from Central America. I volunteer on uh, Tuesdays uh, with uh, Interfaith at the airport. And uh, what I do there is I have a set of backpacks. And uh, when the folks are brought to the uh, airport by uh, the Customs and Immigration Service, which means that they pass their, their credible fear interview and they have a one year um, uh, period to be in the United States and file officially, for, formally for asylum and they have a person or a contact that they're going to stay with in, here in the United States. And what we do is we have a backpack that's got some supplies for them, and uh, we help them uh, get their airplane tickets. Generally, uh, their family members or the person that they're going to stay with has bought the airplane ticket for them, and we help them uh, go through security, help them get to their gate, show them what it means to, to transfer from one air to, if there's a uh, layover, how they have to go from one airline to the other as they find their way. And we also uh, uh, make contact with their, uh, uh, the person that's gonna help them at the destination and make sure they're gonna be there at the uh, destination airport to pick them up and, and take care of them. I get a lot of phone calls from uh, these travelers as after they reach their destination, they call back again. It's just having somebody that they can talk to. And they have questions about, well, what happens if I miss my appointment? Or I'm not in the same location that I, at the same address that I gave when I first filed for uh, asylum here in the United States. Or am I, uh, most of them, a lot all of them, but a fair number of them have an electronic monitoring device, a grillete. And they have questions about that it's not charged up. So it's it's just uh, having somebody that can reach out and 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 help them uh, kind of navigate the process as they seek to to uh, obtain asylum here uh, asylum here in the United States. This is a snapshot of the famous bus stop downtown uh, St. Mary's in Navarro. 
here we are. Um, generally, the volunteers are, are at the bus stop uh, from sometimes as early as 6.30 in the morning till 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I have to say that the people at the Greyhound bus station have been incredible. Uh, they're always out alerting us. If there's somebody that seems to be lost or is, has come up uh, without um, the uh, necessary paperwork or they need a place to stay overnight, partners with the interfaith or Catholic charities, they oftentimes will provide support for overnight housing. The Mennonite Church downtown on South St. Mary's will help out. And of course, uh, with the Interfaith Welcoming uh, Coalition, we sometimes will help out. United Methodist, when we had the surge last year, we and we were using the resources of the city of San Antonio for the Migrant Resource Center, which was incredible. Uh, we were using uh, United Methodist uh, there at Travis Park for overnight lodging. The travelers on the bus, is it's a little more difficult because normally the bus ride is two or three days, so we have a uh, more, more, uh, a, a larger backpack, I guess is the way I would say it, in terms of the, the uh, material that we give these people to help them uh, on their way. And we also, uh, if necessary, can make a cash, uh, cash outlay if they don't, don't have any money at all. And generally they don't. But uh, most of the time, our, our support is through material in the backpacks and snacks and stuff like that. At the airport, it's a little more straightforward. The only difficulty at the airport is, is that uh, for most of the travelers, they haven't flown before. And so there you're, uh, we're, we're showing them what it means to travel by air, what it means to go through the security checkpoints, how to get their tickets, explaining to them uh, what it means to ride on the plane, uh, how to find their seats. And then we also check in with the ticket agents to make sure that there's an assist if somebody can speak Spanish, uh, if they're going to Houston or going to Atlanta, that there'll be somebody there to help them on their way as they uh, make, uh, make their layover and uh, seek onward transportation. It's hard to read this slide, but uh, this is a sample of the material that we're providing uh, in our uh, bus station backpack. There's toiletries toothbrushes and um, personal uh, hygiene. We also um, provide snacks, fruit bars and apples. And, and these are done by different volunteers in different churches in the, in the San Antonio area that make up these lunch bags for us. And then we store them and then portion them out as we need them. On the bus, we can provide bottles of water and we also provide small blankets during the winter. We were providing also hoodies because it gets cold. And, and and depending on the age of the child and whether the child is healthy or not, we sometimes will provide a little bit of cough medicine or some baby aspirins and that sort of stuff. What's been the impact of the um, immigration policy changes? For example, in 2019, we gave out almost nine, well, 18,500 backpacks. And our rule of thumb is, is that we give out a backpack, not for every child, but for every family. And most of the time the family is two people. So you can see that, you know, 35, 40,000 people. At the airport, uh, we gave out about 7,000 backpacks. In 2020, uh, as of the end of March, we've only given out 412 backpacks at the bus station and 341 at the airport. So you can see how the policy changes implemented by the Trump administration have really shut down the border. So the interfaith is doing more with the increased focus is now on advocacy. We're being asked to write letters to our congressmen and senators uh, to help uh, education at the state level and uh, particularly working and, and appealing to DHS uh, to be uh, aware of the humanitarian aspects of our, our immigration policy. The other thing that we're doing is that we're providing more support for our border partners. Uh, we just uh, provided a donation of about 40 some odd thousand dollars, $45,000 to uh, eight different shelters in the Rio Grande Valley, well, from the Rio Grande Valley, 
all the way up to uh, Ciudad, uh, well, Laredo. And uh, this is both in uh, in the United States. We also did it in Nuevo Laredo, El Paso, Ciudad Juarez, San Benito, Eagle Pass, Piedras Negras, uh, Reynosa. Uh, it's one of the ways that the interfaith can help um, alleviate some of the difficulties for those working in the front lines, so to speak, at the shelters on the border. If you'd care to make a donation, here's our website, the interfaith welcomecoalition.org, donate. Or if you would like to mail a check, you can just mail a check to the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, care of the University Presbyterian Church at uh, 300 uh, Bushnell, San Antonio, Texas. So what's happened uh, with the new protocols? Okay, the one uh, that is, uh, and this is still undergoing uh, legal challenges, is the Migration Protection Protocol, MPP, or commonly called Remain in Mexico. It's been enforced since January 29, and it meters those seeking asylum to stay in Mexico. Given the coronavirus and the crowded conditions and the shelters on the border, uh, there, there's all kinds of problems uh, waiting there. And now uh, we've had refinements to the MPP, and one is called the Prompt Asylum Claim Review. PACR, and that's for a uh, person not a Mexican, is set for an interview. That person has, on the border, has a 24-hour window to seek legal assistance in preparation for an asylum interview. And that's when they come across the border in the morning, and there's an interview by television, and then they're, they're shuffled back over into Mexico to wait for the decisions. It's almost impossible to do this. Uh, the uh, accredited representatives like myself or the attorneys that are working on the border means that we really have to be on call 24 hours a day and, and be able to respond when somebody calls to, to go to the border, or, and if we're in the border area, go to these facilities. And oftentimes it's, we have to do it by telephone because the Border Patrol says whether it's just not a space to do this or because of the coronavirus, uh, virus, we can't have more people in, the, in this tent courtroom that they've set up. If the asylum interview is not successful, then that person is placed in what we call exp expedited removal. And again, has to remain in CBP detention until deported. And that can be uh, very quick, less than a day. The humanitarian asylum process is the same process, but it's for Mexican citizens. Finally, uh, the, one of the uh, rules that the Trump administration has tried to put, and it's still under legal uh, challenges, that's the protocol that's based on immigration in Europe that says a person coming to the United States has to first, has to ask for asylum in the first country that they've entered after leaving their home country. Mexico, uh, Guatemala, Honduras. We're the government is talking to them about that, but it's not. Uh, it's it, given, in my understanding, it's not a uh, an agreed upon procedure. The goal of the emergency models is to reduce the number of detainees in U.S. custody and to reduce the risk of, of spreading these infections across the border stations. And and the flow of unauthorized border crossings has plunged since these measures were implemented on Saturday, March 21st. For example, we were at, the Border Patrol reported they were averaging about 1,000 per day for the border, and uh, a week later it was down to about 600 per day. And then under these rules, uh, the U.S. Border Patrol agents are processing these migrants from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras in the field before they're even able to set foot in the United States. That means that they are staying in border and it, it, it gives a lot of authority to the Border Patrol agent. Uh, one estimate that I've heard is that migrants who cross in the United States illegally are being expelled to Mexico in an average of 96 minutes under these emergency corona uh, measures. So bottom line is, what, what do they need? 
Okay, well, you've seen some of the stuff from the backpacks, but uh, part of the part of the issue is as community health workers, I think, is just the trauma that folks that are in our area that do arrive to the San Antonio area is that they need um, um, they need legal assistance to maintain their stay here in the United States, and they need legal assistance. And it's not only myself, but other uh, non-for-profit organizations that can help them uh, do this work on a pro bono. That's the main thing. The other uh, issue that I, the other thing that I think where they need help is just understanding what it means to be seeking asylum here in the United States and understand what access they might have to uh, medical help, uh, to uh, outreach programs from the city of San Antonio. Okay, that's about all I have to say this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be, to, be happy to take them and try to answer. All right, great. Um, <clears throat> so we do have a couple of questions, Fred. Uh, okay. First of all, before before I forget, um, we do have uh, some people asking if you can share the PowerPoint, if we can go ahead and share that with everyone. And I know that it does contain information as far as your contact information, as well as, um, you know, the list of items to be donated. So will that be available to share with everyone? Yes, I need to. Um, I, I don't want to. Well, let me uh, send that to you later. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And we can talk a little bit more. Definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. And so we have one of our questions. Um, what about people on hold for immigration in the Bear County Jail? Normally they would process out of Pearsall and be taken to the border within a month. Right now they seem to not be moving anyone. Is this a violation of rights? Uh, who is working on that? And how long can they be held before deportation? Actually, that's a very good question. The uh, rule is, is that they're supposed to be only held in detention in these processes for 72 hours. But because of the, the emergency uh, model that's being used, we've had people uh, in, in detention for as long as a week. And, but it's, and there are court cases pending on that. Okay. And do they explain the public charge law to the clients? No. Okay. The public charge law was just implemented on uh, February the 24th. And um, there's a lot of confusion about folks that are receiving, who may be receiving, for example, some of the benefits that the federal government will be providing under the um, uh, CARE Act. Um, or if people are accepting um, uh, medical help. My understanding from what I've read from the United States Citizens uh, um, Immigration Service is that receiving benefits under the CARE Act will not affect their um, status as, as a public charge. That said, however, if the person is... Um, in the process of applying for lawful permanent residence or is in the process for applying for citizenship, they're going to have to answer the question truthfully that they've accepted a public benefit. Then they need to explain exactly what the circumstances was. And that's the guidance that uh, USCIS is providing to uh, folks like me to help uh, in the application process. Right. And what about um, any immigrants that may not be Spanish speaking or outside of the San Antonio area? Are you assisting them? We, uh, there are different organizations. Our focus is mostly for those who are uh, Spanish capable, but there are different other NGOs here in San Antonio that can handle uh, different languages. If in fact we have somebody that's speaking quiche or mom uh, from Central America, we have access to translation services to uh, help those folks in the process. Okay, and so I okay. imagine that part of this would be, uh, they can reach out to you uh, at the information Absolutely. you'll provide on those. Okay, great. Absolutely. Thank you very much for everything, okay. Fred, and thank you everyone.
Okay. Thank you very much. And we're going to go get on to the next session.